call the meeting to order. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to our special meeting and our special committee meeting that we have tonight. Excuse me, Mayor. I am so sorry. Your microphone got relocated for the little photographs. Oh, okay. Here you go. Excuse me. No problem. They don't need to hear me anyway. <laughs> we'll call this special meeting to order. Uh, we'll have a special meeting and a committee and a committee meeting tonight. And the first item on the agenda is the presentation of the town's physical year 2018 and 2019 audit. Uh, council members received a copy of the audit last week after it was formally approved by the local government commission. Uh, each of you got to see that. So Donna Winburn and Leslie Jefferson, uh, the town's auditors, are here tonight to present uh, the audit and answer any questions. So Donna, it's all yours. Thank you for having me. I'm not used to a microphone either, so I hope I do this right. <laughs> I am pleased to present the financial report for the town of Edenton for the year ended June 30th, 2019. The financial statements are management's responsibility. My responsibility is to express an opinion on them based on the audit, and I've issued an unmodified opinion. That's the highest level that you can receive, and it means that the statements are fairly presented in all re material respects in conformity with generally accepted accounting principles. So you have a letter in front of you and then you have your bound audit document. And I'll go ahead and mention the letter, this is not a management letter, I did not issue a management letter this year. This is your governance letter. And as Hack said, he's heard me do this speech so many times and so I'm going to say the same thing so you don't have to listen to this part. Um, your governance letter is required and that's where I would communicate with you if there were any um, problems during the audit that I felt like I needed to communicate in writing to you if there was a new pronouncement that we were implementing and then I would describe it there. You have what is, is really a boilerplate you know, uh, letter this year so there's nothing extra special in it. Um, not like a management letter like you've had before. So um, Now we can go to the audit document. If you will turn um, in the paper document to page 16. This is the balance sheet for your governmental funds. And the first column shows your general fund, and that's the one that we normally go over. Um, if you'll look at the third number up from the bottom, that shows your unassigned fund balance. And that number is $1,797,000. Um, that is a marked improvement from last year. I know you're most interested to hear that, so I, I tend to tell a lot of bad news, but that's your good news um, for this year, is that that is, um, does look better than it looked last year. Um, last year, that number was 635000 so big improvement. Um, now, if you'll turn two pages over to Exhibit 4, this shows your statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance for the governmental funds. And again, that first column is your general fund. And if you look up from the bottom, you'll see the increase for the year is $253,403. Now you may say, well, how did our unassigned fund balance increase so much when we only had a $253,000? It changed for the year. Um, the difference comes in your makeup of your equity. So if you were to compare your fund balance section from last year to this year, you would see a difference in some of those numbers. And so that's how that changes. Part of the increase is because of your $253,403 increase. The other part is that we had some restrictions last year. So we have a um, stabilization um, for state statute, and that is basically your receivables that you have on the books. And so you have to restrict those. And so those were less this year. Um, your due froms in that fund, and we've talked about that a lot, those were decreased this year also. So those types, the composition of that plays into it as well as the change for the year. Okay. 
So now if you'll go to uh, page 22, this is Exhibit 7. And this is your statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund net position for electric, water and sewer, and the airport fund. And it, if you look at, once you let's see the fifth number up from the bottom, that shows your net change for the year. And in the electric fund, we had an increase of $192,681, not too far off from where you were last year. Um, the water fund, $551,508. Now that is a considerable increase over last year. You had a small loss last year. Um, that's attributable mostly um, to some rental income that came in on a new contract. And then in the airport fund, there was an increase of $412,077. How close is that from last year? That last, well, let's just look, it's 336000 is what it was last year, and I did not look back real quick to see what kind of a change. Um, we could find out, but a lot of times, you know, for, there may be one item. I'm not sure on that one right now. Okay. We had one finding, um, and that is related. Um, go to the, if you go to the back on page A5, I'm not going to read through, or A6 rather. It's, it deals with the pre-audit, and we did have that last year. Um, one thing that we found, I hate, hated to put it in here really, but um, we felt like we needed to because what we saw this year as an, as an improvement over last year was we could actually see the documentation and Maria's is approving invoices. And I know she's looking at them because I see her signature. Um, but the statute, you have to have the language, and so there's a stamp and we just have to get the stamp on all of those invoices. And we've all talked about that, and they're doing that now. Um, and they were doing it on some of them, but it's not all of them. So um, this is one of those you just kind of apologize as you put it in here, um, because I know she's looking at them. But without that specific language, um, I felt like I had to do that. So it's the key thing here is you've got to make sure uh, demonstrate that you know there's money in the budget before you spend the money. That is exactly it. Okay. And that language, a lot of times um, entities use purchase orders. And with those purchase orders, there's <coughs> blanket language that's on there that meets the statute. And so if you've it, now you've got to issue the purchase order before you actually buy the item. <laughs> um, because sometimes that doesn't always happen either. But um, as long as that language is on there, you've met the requirement of the statute. Um, if you're not using a purchase order system or not using it all the time, then it just has to go on there. And the easiest thing to do is just to have a stamp that has a little place for you to also initial. And that kind of, sh it, it documents all of it. But that's exactly right. It's to make sure the budget is in place before it's spent. And I'll let you all can, I'm sure you probably already read through that, but it gives what the plan is and what, what they're doing about that. Did you all have any questions? I guess my observation is it's much improved from last year. I think that's a It is. The really numbers do thing. are yeah. better. Thanks to Virginia and Anne Marie for <laughs> the hard work. And all the department heads. Uh, Anne Marie, didn't last year, didn't that have something to do with funds coming in not at the time, appropriate time? Did yes. that have something to do with it? Well, as it I was, remember? you're right, and it was a combination of things that kind of hit us all at one time, yeah. the perfect storm. But we had a number of grant receivables that were due to the town that didn't come in by June 30. They came in, you know, early July. And so the LGC coach team and the League of Municipalities coached
Virginia and I to start looking for those receivables that were due like in May and June. And I'm telling you, June 30 was one of the most wildest days at Town Hall. We actually had to call the police chief. He was in a, a training in Wilson. I said, you got to get out of there. You got to go to Raleigh and pick up a check <laughs> that the Division of Emergency Management had promised to mail to us weeks ago, and they didn't mail. And then Virginia found out that she went over to the county to pick up a big receivable that the county owed us for fire protection and that day for some reason the county put it in the mail god bless them so we called the post office and the new postmaster figured out what postal worker collected it and found and went back into the mail room and pulled the check for it so i mean if we hadn't done those two things we would have had probably, you know, four hundred thousand dollars worth of receivables that would have hit us again. But the coach team taught us you got to go after every penny by June thirty. Um, and, and then we they had just spent a million dollars on paving streets. And yep. All of that coming together just yeah. created a. And then as I you think said, a perfect storm. The other thing that we learned, and especially, you know, right in the last year or two, we have so many capital projects going on a lot of them are grants and we were just adding those to the general fund and they said don't do that because we literally added a million dollars worth of expenditures and that million dollars is part of the formula that calculates what our fund balance is and so by shifting that into those capital project ordinances that you all have been adopting We've lowered the expense level in the general fund, and therefore the fund balance increased. So we we learned a lot. We learned a, hard, a few hard. We learned good lessons the hard way. That I think we're much better. Um, you know, it's not so much that the town's financial position has changed. It's that we're managing That's right. the books in a way to take better. advantage of all of the. Um, opportunities to have a good financial statement. Is because, that accurate? Yeah, I think it yeah. is accurate. Because when you have those receivables, you think, well, that's crazy that you have to run all over the state and pick up a check. I mean, it sounds crazy that you would have to do that. You don't have to do that. But Anne-Marie knew, like, from the way that the unassigned fund balance fell last year, she was trying to do what she could to improve the position. <laughs> and and she, it's a village. <laughs> That's a, so she was telling me the story during field work, and I was like, wow, that's some serious effort right there. Um, because she's right. It doesn't change what you have. It just changes where it shows up. So when I first mentioned whether it was um, that restricted by state stabilization, so. If it, it's not like you weren't going to get it, I mean, or when you were, but the timing of when you got it, it's showing up as a receivable, restricts that revenue down there. So um, that part makes a difference, but anyway. And then um, we've been talking to the council about our new, uh, or I guess the upgrade to our financial management system. And there were some delays um, that were beyond our control about when that upgrade was implemented. And, but it was implemented in August, and so we have, you know, 10 months out of this current fiscal year where um, we know that we're um, far better in, in compliance and making sure. I even have a little sticky note on my computer. It says pre-audit. You know, most people have, like, teams that they cheer for. You know, I'm like, pre-audit, pre-audit. And I heard Virginia today. We had a vendor working on something at a repair at Town Hall. She said, well, I need to know how much it's going to cost because I have to pre-audit it. I mean, I overheard her saying that to the, um, to the vendor. So we're really, really trying extremely hard to make sure that we're all pre-auditing and purchasing in compliance. Right, Corey? I, we have an emergency. Um, Corey, yeah, we've got to get it fixed, but... Get a PO. <laughs> Donna, as a chairman of the finance committee, thank you for you know working through this with us. And You're welcome. Thank you. Thank everybody on staff for pulling together and figuring this out and doing so much better. And and I would like to thank Anne Marie and Virginia also. 
um, it, it's a lot of work pulling all this together. And um, they are, are always there um, pushing forward. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you, Leslie. Okay. Does anyone have any questions of Donna or Anne Marie? Okay. I'll, at this time, I'll call on Amory to review the letter from the local government commission regarding the findings in the town's corrective actions so, or action plan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the LGC, and we knew we were going to get a letter when there was a finding. Um, anytime there's a finding in the audit, the LGC sends a letter to the highest elected official and copies all of the council members. Um, and then we're required to submit a response within 45 days. And so we um, drafted a response for you to consider, and we um, sent that out yesterday. And um, I guess first I want to say that I was very um, pleased to see that the LGC acknowledged the significant improvements that the town made. So we appreciated that. And in our letter um, to the LGC, we kind of um, highlighted for them the um, steps that we took that helped improve um, the situation. And then regarding the pre-audit finding, um, we basically um, reported what was in our corrective action plan in the audit, that um, we are pre-auditing all contracts and agreements um, prior to presenting um, to the council for action. And then we also um, are pre audit pre-auditing um, line items in the budget, the appropriations that you all make, like to the Chamber, to the Arts Council, um, those, have, those forms have been changed so that Virginia will pre-audit and certify that funds are available. And then I'm going to need help from Donna and Leslie on how to pre-audit the um, landfill fees that we collect on behalf of the county, but We'll, we'll figure that out. I just don't want to add that expense to the general fund budget, so you can help us with that. But we're um, prepared, if um, the mayor um, is satisfied with the letter, to have him sign it and send it to the LGC. And we are so excited. We'll be soliciting um, bids from the bank for the financing for the street resurfacing. And we're hoping to go back to the LGC in early spring, and I can't wait to go back and have this audit um, with Virginia and me to show the good work that we've done. So. Okay. Thank you, Emory. Uh, and thank you, Donna and, and Leslie, for your hard work on this. And there is no uh, action required on this tonight. Uh, so we'll move forward with that. The next item on the agenda tonight is a resolution authorizing the execution and delivery of the allonge to the two point huh? We got that word to correct. the two point six million dollar water and sewer revenue bond anticipation date. And Amory, if you will present this action item for us. I'd be happy to and the um, town's uh, council had engaged bond council. Um, to help us with this project and bond council mcguire wood mcguire mcguire wood mcguire mcguire wood out of raleigh you remember um connor cruz was with you last year when you um approved the project and the pro the you think of the financing as kind of like a construction loan when you're building if you're building a house you have to get the bank to agree to do the um, construction loan and then when the project is finished you have the mortgage to pay off. And um, our project was expected to take 12 months to complete. And as I detailed in the agenda review, there were a couple reasons why um, it's taken longer than 12 months. But we've been assured that it will be completed by the end of February and <coughs> early March. Um, but because the project is not going to be fin substantially completed by February 1st, we need to extend um, the loan for another 45 days or so. And everybody has agreed to that. Um, USDA has agreed, the Local Government Commission has agreed, and most importantly, um, PNC, the bank that um, provided the interim financing has agreed. 
Bond Council um, prepared the resolution, which we're asking for you to approve. And if you um, approve that, that will authorize the mayor, um, the finance officer, and myself to execute a stack of documents that we'll then have to certify and ship overnight to the Bond Council tomorrow so that the loan can be closed. Um, they're, I think they're scheduled for the loan closing to be done on Thursday. All right. Thank you, Emory. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions up here? What, what, is, is it the same uh, interest rate for the uh, additional? It yes. is. Okay. They've agreed to keep the rate the same. I think it was 4.54%. Okay. Any other questions for Emory on this? Okay. If not, we'll need a, a, a motion. Uh, Authorize the execution and delivery of it. So, so moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carried. Okay, and the final item on the special meeting agenda is a closed session for the, to consult with our legal attorney on, on a, a, a Regarding the Vincent Booger uh, the third versus the town of Eden, and this litigation pertains to the appeal to Superior Court that Mr. Berger made regarding the decision of the Board of Adjustments. Uh, the Board of Adjustments affirmed the decision the Eden Preservation Commission made regarding the fence Mr. Berger constructed on his property. But as a courtesy to the uh, audience tonight, we're going to I'll need a motion to. Uh, Recess. Recess the, the committee meeting until after the till the end of the meeting. So move, Mayor. Okay. We have a second. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. <clears throat> okay. So now we'll call the the uh, committee meetings to order, and the first one on there is our quarter is the administrative committee. And that's chaired by Hackney. Yeah, <laughs> Councilman Hi. Thank you, Mayor Stallings. Uh, we have five items that we need to address tonight. <clears throat> and with the permission of the council and the committee members, I'd like to recommend that we move item five, which is the sailing and water sports uh, center item, to item number one. We've got Gil Burroughs here on behalf of the Yacht Club, and I understand that he's got a uh, previous uh, obligation, um, and it would accommodate him if we could move that. Does anybody have any objection to us moving that to uh, item number one? Uh, what um, we've been asked to consider is a pro proposal from the Edenton Yacht Club to uh, fund construction of a structure that would serve as a storage facility for uh, kayaks and sailboats, stand-up paddleboards, paddle boards, and other non-propelled uh, um, uh, water type of uh, uh, equipment. And uh, I talked with Anne Marie about it, and we thought it would be first good for her to summarize kind of the history of this item, and then Gil's got a, a proposal that he'd like to make. And after he makes that uh, proposal, uh, the committee will be uh, discussing some action items related to that. So, Anne Marie, if you'll get us a little short history of, sure. of this particular issue. Thank you. I'm happy to do that. So, um, the council recalls that as part of the due diligence um, the town underwent regarding the sale of the proposed Conger building, one of the things that count the mayor and council tasked um, us to do was to make sure that we had a viable plan to continue the Recreation Department's wonderful sailing program. Um, and then also um, the town and the county together use, utilize and promote kayaking and stand-up paddleboard and canoeing. And they wanted to make sure that because the building was, a portion of that building was used to store that equipment, um, that there could still be there be a plan going forward so that could be properly utilized. And uh, um, a committee was appointed and um, consensus was reached on um, two alternatives of where to locate the facility. 
Um, the Yacht Club recently came forward with a proposal to help fund um, the, the facility. And um, so Shannon Ray is here with the Chowan County Rec Department and myself and Searsha and others have been working with Mr. Burroughs representing the Yacht Club um, on this really neat proposal. And it is in harmony with what the um, committee's report ultimately recommended, that a structure be built um, in Colonial Park that could house um, the, the various equipment. And the Yacht Club is interested in having um, a, pla a, 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 a place not only where they could meet, but where the um, rec department could use as a classroom to help facilitate teaching, and then as well as any visiting boaters uh, or people on transient boaters instead of just having to hang out on their boat all the time it's often that there are facilities at marinas where the boaters can um, mingle and meet and talk sailing and so there would be a structure for that but i think one of the really stellar pieces of their proposal is a um, covered or sheltered picnic area and that has been something that we have had on our master plan for a long time People love um, having picnics and family reunions at um, our park, but it's brutal in the summer um, without a shelter. And so the, um, the plan is to create and build a structure that would house all of those functions together. Um, so with that, maybe um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and tee up the PowerPoint for Mr. Burroughs. As you are aware, the Yacht Club has been involved and very much encouraged to participate in sailing programs here. Myself personally, I've taught sailing here for over 20 years, uh, and the Yacht Club has been involved in this kind of program for over 40 years. Uh, the existing uh, building, the Congress building, there was at one time what we call the topless building and that was because it didn't have a top on it. And the Yacht Club uh, undertook to uh, enclose that, and that had been used up until the present time for the place for the sailing program to operate out of. With the sale of the building, that's no longer available. So we needed some kind of long-term solution to the problem, and I think we have to offer the community a win-win-win solution. It's a win for the county and their recreation program, as well as the town, which I believe you all are involved in uh, renting out some material, some voting things. It's also a win for uh, not only the county, but for the public with the sheltered picnic area. And then it's, it's a win for the, for the yacht club it will give us an opportunity to have a presence on the waterfront and interact with those voters who visit our area. You may not be aware that there's a loop program now to encourage voters to make a loop around the whole of the Albemarle Sound. Uh, and that's getting quite a bit of promotion. One of the things that uh, puts us at a little bit of disadvantage is the fact that we're on the very western end of the loop. Uh, so we need to do anything we can do to enhance our waterfront and encourage voters to do the whole loop, not just kind of take a shortcut across from Columbia to Albemarle Plantation and then head east. So uh, this is going to be a win-win for everybody, I think. Uh, so. Uh, this is, this is our proposal. Uh, if you'll notice, the, the location of the Congress building, that's the, uh, the white building there, and then the location of the, of the uh, lighthouse down there. And the proposed location is where, way back when, uh, there used to be a stage there. 
if you remember when the Save the Waterfront Committee initially got the bulkheading for that property, we raised money for it and we put some facilities on there and there was a stage there uh, for performances. Isabel took care of that. Uh, it went out with Isabel. Uh, the location there actually is where one of the Congress metal buildings was when uh, he had his facility down there. There's several uh, advantages to that. It puts it extremely closely to where all of these water sports activities would have to launch their vessels. Uh, they don't have to cross anything but about 30 or 40 feet of grass. Uh, so it makes it extremely convenient. Uh, could you go? Well, could I ask you a quick question? Yeah. What is that, what's the dotted line? The yellow dotted line? The dotted line is the boundary for the property that was purchased through that federal uh, land grant. Uh, so does that mean we can't, we can't put anything on the side towards the Barker House? Is that, is that the boundary line of that? Uh, oh no, that's just the boundary line that has been encumbered by the purchase of that for outdoor recreation, with the exception of the area of a rectangle surrounding the Conger building. That was not a part of the original grant. Okay, so it's all, we have to get permission to do this? Okay. That, yes. I guess that was, that was okay. Yes. Everything to the right of that dotted line is not a part of that original purchase, and it's not encumbered. And, and what if, so the, the part of the, to the right is not encumbered? That's not okay. encumbered. All right. Everything else on the other side, with the exception of the property around the Conger building, is encumbered and can only be used for outdoor recreation. Can, can I just interrupt you sure. and interject? In the agenda review memo, we told the council there was, for the first time in many, many years, the land um, LWC is offering grant funds to communities that have LWC parks. But Searsha and I attended the webinar the other day, and we were really disappointed to find out that one of the conditions would be, whoops, We had the idea of applying for grant funds to do some repairs to the bulkheading on the property, and then we were going to try and use the Yacht Club's $50,000 contribution as a cash match to leverage the funds. But for some reason, the Park Service is saying, well, if you get a grant on this property and you have parkland adjacent to LWC, property, a condition of getting funding for this is going to be that they encumber that. And we don't think that's a good move at this point. So we are pursuing other funding. Shannon um, alerted us to some CAMA funding that wouldn't have those kind of requirements. All right. It was a footprint there. This is, this is the uh, layout of the building that we proposed. It would be 32 feet wide and 52 feet long. Uh, I have a crude kind of model here and a shoebox. Uh, <laughs> nice, okay, that, that I made so you could get an idea. Uh, it's kind of like that. Uh, it would be oriented on the property to where the, the uh, picnic sheltered area that you see on the left would actually be facing the water, okay? And then what would be the, the west side, the boat storage area, that's where the, uh, the water craft would be. And on the east side would, would be a multi-purpose room. This would be used, it would be available to the recreation department to hold uh, their sailing program classes in such as that. Uh, also, what I envision there is a uh, kind of a welcome center for the boaters, a place where the ones that come in and use our harbor here, they could come in and use this room uh, for just chilling, 
Uh, <laughs> and uh, quite frequently in uh, communities that have facilities like this, they have a, a book exchange. People that go cruising, they have a lot of time on their hands and they read a lot of books. And so what you do is you, you take the books that you've read two or three times and you're tired of them and you go into a place like this and there's books in there that people have left. You leave one or two of yours and take one or two of theirs. Uh, so also we can have it, uh, I envision a nice big wide screen uh, television set up there, flat panel deal, where you could watch videos and the whole nine yards. I mean, it would just be a real nice kind of amenity for people who cruise through here and they would have access to that room also. And of course, the Yacht Club would use it to put out trophies that we win uh, when we defeat all of the other boaters on the Albemarle Sand, which we frequently do. Uh, would, there so, be, would there be any, I guess not, restroom facility or restroom? No. no, no. We already have restroom facilities on the park, okay. both not for open for the public, and keep access for voters, okay? And these two parts, the boat storage and, and the room there, okay, would be keyed access. And so the people who have boat storage would have access to that. The rec department would have access to the room. And yacht club members would. And so would visiting voters. So it would be usable for those people. By just like the restrooms that we have out there now. Uh, what would be the distance between the boat storage to the ramp? What? What would be the distance from the storage to the ramp? It's Well, camera says we can't get any closer than 30 feet. Okay. So we're going to be about 30 <coughs> feet away from it. Uh, and, and can it, I, so in the, what we got in our packet had a, had a first slide that had, had it up at like, up on the, I guess Water Street. Is it that the first slide is a different location? What's that? Well, that's that, that excuse me. That was um, the options when we were studying. Okay, I mean, Kansas but that. So where did that one come from? That was one of the options that the committee a couple of years. Okay, ago. gotcha. All right. I'm just a little bit confused. 2016. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is what we're proposing. Got it. Okay. But with respect to that property between Water Street and uh, Congre Building. We're going to need that for parking. Uh, with the brewery coming in there, the, the uh, brewery there, uh, they're going to need, uh, according to the UDO, they're going to need somewhere between 20 and 30 parking spaces, uh, which takes up everything in front of Congress building and one side of the other parking up there. So we, we need to keep that open for future expansion of our, of our parking area. <coughs> But back to the building, okay? Uh, this, this is kind of what we envision it looking like. Uh, and I think I have a, a slide or two in there. Uh, this is a picture. Some people had, uh, had thought, you know, what's it going to look like? Well, this is a picture taken from the playground area. Okay, you're out there at the playground area and you're looking out towards the towards the lighthouse, okay? And what I put there is I photoshopped in, in correct proportion, okay, for the distance of for the building, what this particular building that you see here, okay? Uh, and I also have a picture, I think, yes. This is picture taken from Water Street, looking out towards the bay, See the Congress building on the right, the proposed water sports center, and the lighthouse. Okay? So that would be kind of what it looks like. Let's see what else have we got. We got anything else? I think that was it. That's it. Okay. Uh, the yacht club, uh, we're we're fronting up up fifty thousand dollars, okay, to construct this. Uh, Personally, uh, I'm going to get it done if you all let us do it, okay? One way or the other. And I have, uh, I think, 
reasonable credentials for fulfilling my word in our previous activity down there with the bulkading of the front and the construction of the park, which we did uh, way back in the 70s. I think it was. Center East uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was, you had yeah, 50,000. What do you think the, the total cost is going to be for this project? Any idea? Well, I've got a ballpark. Okay, I, I think we, because we're going to do the construction. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, you know, and I've already contacted uh, different groups in the community that would assist us in the construction of this thing. So we'll keep the labor down to about zero. Uh, I really feel that we can pull it in at $50,000. Uh, what time frame would that take, do you think? Well, Nothing before spring, that's for sure. I don't like working outside in the cold weather. Uh, but I would, I would think, okay, that from the time we lay, this will be on a concrete slab, okay, uh, from the time that we start building it, okay, I don't see any reason why we couldn't finish it in about three months. Uh, six on the outside, but I really think three months. It's going to be basically concrete slab, and then you see the only enclosed part is the uh, is the classroom area, uh, and the truss roof, and so things should go pretty quickly. Yeah, can I ask him a question while you're doing it? Uh, Gil, I saw uh, somewhere in your materials a figure of 1,664 square feet. Is that um, the approximate size of this thing, both enclosed and unenclosed? Uh, well, if you multiply 52 times 32, you'll come up with the number. I don't have it right off the hand. Okay. But any of y'all got a smartphone, you can pull that up. <laughs> and whatever that amount is, is that your recommended amount of space? Is that a minimum amount of space? Well, is that, that a that's optimal the footprint amount? of the building. Okay. But now I'm asking you from the yacht club's perspective: Is that the amount of space that that you need? Is that uh, yeah. a minimal or recommended? That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thirty-two by fifty-two. Okay. So, we met with the building inspector and the floodplain administrator the other day. Thank you, Evie. And the structure will have to comply with the flood ordinance, and so it, we can't say it's just going to be built on slab. Remember, it has to be elevated and... How many feet? We are going to get the, the flood elevation certificate, but... What do you guess? Was it Either four? That was about the approximate. Four, about four percent. feet, yeah. And it's either going to be elevated or flood-proofed. Or flood-proofed. Or flood-proofed, so, flood flood yes. We plan on flood-proofed. That's right. And, but I just don't want people to think, yeah. you know, we have to go through the same permitting application requirements that everyone else has to do. And so we've yeah. got and a lot it's of... All, it's also got to go through the historic district commission. It's got to go the preservation through commission. the exterior. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're leaving the, the architectural and the aesthetics aspect of it up to the preservation and the historic group and whatever. Uh, we, we'll do whatever has to be done. We want the functionality that this will provide, yeah. which is tremendous as far as I'm concerned. So and basically uh, the training room, what? basically what you're looking for is the training room, the storage boat storage room, and the porch over it, yeah. the covered porch. That, that porch area is, is sufficient to uh, put picnic tables on that could accommodate up to probably about 50 people. So it would be substantial. So, Gil, I spend a lot of time in regattas all around, all over the place, from mm -hmm. Florida to Maine with my yeah. youngest daughter. I mean, she sails competitively. And I've never seen anything host a regatta that's that little. I mean, I just wondered if you need more space everywhere we go. Is there a requirement from the uh, sailing association that says, you know, if you're going to actually start hosting regattas, you need A, B, and C? No. As a matter of fact, in the past, we have frequently hosted in Edenton uh, regardless for one design sailing. As a matter of fact, I forget what year it was, we had the thistles, the, the national thistles here, 
and we hosted 75 yachts with no space, okay? Uh, and if you walk around, you'll see a crane on our property there. You'll see a crane right out that end, and on the other park over there, you'll see another crane there. I personally put all three of those with a little bit of assistance up to handle that kind of thing. We can host them. We've done it before. We've probably hosted at least a half a dozen. We haven't done it recently. That's a problem. That's a wonderful economic thing that we can do. We need to get somebody huge. that's hot on them. Yeah, I, I've done some, but not enough. I'm getting a little old, and so I, I need some young blood to come <laughs> in and take this up and run with it. Okay. You still got your same energy, though. I know. <laughs> I'll see you after sure. <laughs> right, well, anyway, I, I, I won't go there, but uh, at 84, you know, things do slow down a little bit. So, uh, Good God. I just think this is a wonderful opportunity for the community at the present and in the future. So I'll see that it gets done, okay? Mm -hmm. If you just give us the, the authority to go ahead with the process. Thank you. Got any more questions? I have a question. Uh, I think it pertains to the council more than the you. Uh, your program is when you go train people, right? You have training a lot. You got a lot of other activities on the water during the summertime. My question is, is that supposed to be some lifeguard somewhere along the way? Um, we you generally see lifeguards when there is um, swimming, and the um, waterfront is not suitable. Um, for swimming in terms of the, the bar, you know, the, all of the stumps and what have you. But when they have a regatta councilman, they have safety boats. Yeah, they call it the coach boats. Coach so, boats. Yeah, yeah. And they have people on the water stationed being able to assist if there were some sort of person to be d in distress on the water. And they're highly trained. Yeah, yeah I'm just thinking about keeping it. Go out on the little boards, you know, to fall off. And <laughs> well, they're supposed to be wearing life jackets, and okay, yeah. they, they wear like, and they don't fall off. Okay. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> the kids, they'd rather capsize the boats and go swimming than sailing most of the time. That's my experience in, in teaching uh, the sunfish kids. Oh, yeah. uh, they, they love to capsize them, but they got life jackets on. Plus, there's a, a boat, a motorized boat, to take care of them. So we take care of the safety. Okay. <laughs> Good question. Any more questions? Well, I, I just want to make sure we're not voting on anything tonight. No. Uh, we we no, got a lot of work before well, we even. Yeah. Well, what, I think we got to get the design of this thing right. I think we need to make it something that everybody would. I mean, it'd be some something that is as good as the Barker House, the Lighthouse. And I think we need to look at the program to see how we can grow it for our children because this is a great way. I mean, we've had one, you know, Stuart Proctor, I mean, we've had people out of this town that have really gone on <clears throat> to sail, and it's such a, a good, such good discipline, and I think we could really grow a great program. So, I mean, I think we need to really sort of get some, some more feedback, and I think we, you know, really need to, especially since this building's got to be lifted, maybe get an old, older building <clears throat> and maybe get more space. Um, and I think we need to something also to talk to John to Glover blend, about, to blend with yeah. the other architecture and I think there. we need some, somebody needs to talk to John Glover about putting a big structure in yeah. his view shed because I think that's, I think that's something he needs to comment on, um, yeah. well, whether I that's the right place. I'm not saying it is or isn't, but I think that he's putting this big investment into Edenton and, you know, this thing sort of is there. Well, I think there's some things that we can do to gain some momentum and get the project started as long as everybody understands what the vote is and what the vote is not. And I think in order to get it started, there are two or three issues that need to be addressed and can be addressed now 
uh, without us getting into the specifics. And um, Gil and Anne Marie have already mentioned one of those, and that was a grant back in 1970 that uh, restricts use um, to recreational and, and water <coughs> activities. And we certainly think this would pass their muster, but we still need to get their permission. We can't assume that we have their permission, so we need to get their uh, permission. And then, as Anne Marie has already uh, indicated, um, there are a lot of uh, local ordinances, there are a lot of state and federal ordinances and groups, CAMA, for example. Um, and so I think it would be appropriate if I could get a motion from one of the committee members that we authorize staff to go ahead and start seeking that permission, start finding out what the requirements are so we don't wait another month or two to get at least the ball rolling in that regard. Is, is that fair enough? And I would also like somebody to contact U.S. Sailing and see exactly what they prefer to have. Because I know there have been a couple of times that um, you know, we've talked about trying to get regattas here and, and they weren't, it didn't work out for one reason or the other. And I just want to make sure we have all the facilities that would be attractive to, and these regattas come in and they are, you know, several hundred children and their parents stay here and they, you know, they're, they're really exciting, exciting things. And um, the parents have nothing to do during the day, they go shop. Um, you know, do something else and so I think it'd be a good boost for our downtown also. I agree. Well it's kind of a mouthful but um, I would seek a motion from a fellow committee member on, on three things and one would be for Anne Marie to seek approval uh, from the National Park Service uh, being the first part of that motion. The second part is that Anne Marie and staff uh, continue to work with state, uh, local and federal, federal permitting authorities and three, that Emory and staff work with our partners uh, on design uh, considerations and, and can we include Can we include John Glover in on that? I mean, I think that he just needs I think architect. His, yeah. I think his architect could his architect. be very helpful. <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So if, if one of the committee members is so inclined. I'll uh, make that motion, Mayor. And so. You have all the. I do, but I just want to make sure. So this would be a recommendation or a motion from the committee to to put this action item on the regular meeting in yes. February. Right. Okay. And U.S. Sailing. Yes. Okay. I can get your contact. Okay. So moved. Second. 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 And uh, this being my first real official meeting, uh, Anne Marie, do I call for the mo vote or does the mayor call for the vote when we have a. Um, in the past, it's been by you just consent. consensus. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Do we have the committee members consent to move this forward to full council yes. at next month's meeting? Yes. yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you all. I definitely regret quite a practice. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe he's 84. <laughs> the uh, second uh, item for discussion by the committee is uh, one that was brought forth by uh, Councilman. Coleman, and as he and I were uh, running for office in the fall, um, almost every person that we talked to uh, wished there was a better way for the town to communicate what it was doing to the uh, general public. And uh, Councilman uh, Coleman has requested that um, we consider a quarterly newsletter, and also in conjunction with that, uh, Searsha has been working with her partners at NC Fellows. Um, regarding other ways to communicate and have better communication. So this item really is divided into two parts, and I think I'm going to turn it over to Councilman Coleman to explain uh, his ideas about the quarterly newsletter, and then when he's finished, we can turn it over to Searsha to talk more about a program that she's become aware of. The thought was uh, to get as much information as we can out to uh, people in the community who might not uh, uh, be watching TV, might not get the uh, Shawan Herald so that they can feel included and involved in the community. And the thought is that uh, the more knowledge they have, the more likely uh, they are to be involved and to feel a part of what's going on. So the newsletter would reach, what, 2,600 people or something like that, with some very, 2,600 families, with some very basic information about what we're doing at, at, as a council and uh, what some opportunities are in the future. and. Uh, uh, and the, the, uh, we have a, uh, you have a draft of a, a, a sample newsletter in your package. I think it's just a, a marvelous idea. You know, put together some 
very basic information that uh, I think people will be thrilled to have and, and have a better understanding of what we're doing and, and what's going on. A lot is going on. We just don't have, have a good way of getting that information out. And if I'm not mistaken, has Searsha put together a PowerPoint of, of what that would look like? You do not. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't yeah. put you on the spot on that. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, but we got a copy of what they were proposing. Yeah. So okay. yeah. Yes. Which was very nice. And before we move on to Searsha, we we'll talked uh, with her about the uh, program that she has discovered. Uh, any comments uh, uh, about what Roger's proposing or any questions? Uh, to Roger about how, how that would look or how he would anticipate that working. Now, would this go out with the, um, the electrical billing? Now, um, the, 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 that only reaches so many people, right? Well, it reaches almost every family in town. Okay. But what, what, about, over, what or, about the Mill Village where they're well, under? Aren't we doing some of it online? I mean, can't, you do, can't you do a bill pay for electricity we, bills? Well, we're encouraging our customers to go to the, um, <coughs> electronic billing and they would receive that this as well okay is there any way to include on there some way that gives us some feedback about how they like it you know i get a survey for everything i do now sure. so that you know what else would they like to, to you know <laughs> searches put in there <laughs> and you know how, how else can we better inform them of what's going on yes i think and we're just trying to improve communication yeah you know? well i think that you know just ask yeah. them at the end of this thing, you know, do you find it helpful and do you, is there something else we could add to be more helpful? And if I may, Chairman Hyde, to answer Councilman Miller's question, there are some um, neighborhoods where, for instance, in the Mill Village, we do not serve electric. Right. However, we do serve water, so the Mill Village homeowners receive a monthly water okay. and sewer bill they would get, and they would get, get this okay. um, in, the, in the condos in the mill condos we don't serve electric and there's a master meter for um, water so we'll have to figure out something for them and there are some other multi-family apartments where there may be a master meter, but we'll we'll try to figure out a way to make sure that every household receives it. There may be pockets of some that um, we have to okay. figure out. And do we are we collecting emails? I mean, is that, it looks like to me that'd be a good communication tool. The more emails we get, because I mean, not everybody, but a, a large population of people now have emails. Yes, we're trying as part of the new utility system upgrade we are working to collect um, emails as well as cell numbers so that we can communicate that could way. there be the opportunity for citizens to opt out of a paper version mm -hmm. and request simply an electronic version yeah we're hoping they'll do that, mm -hmm. quite frankly and then we also wanted to have an opt-in you know maybe somebody who's thinking about moving here mm -hmm. would want to subscribe and so we would be able to work yeah. up an email for that so we'll put that on our facebook page mm -hmm. and all that okay yeah, i think that's great media. yeah any more questions of uh councilman coleman on that uh, particular issue okay the second part of this item would be um uh, presenting us some information on some programs that she has or a program that she has discovered that might also uh, benefit the public and make them better informed of what we're trying to do so see if you'll let us know about that of course good evening mayor and council thanks for having me um first off i just wanted to quickly address something from the newsletter um one of the questions uh, Councilman Dixon had had was about a survey about the newsletter, you know, what they were thinking. And that is something that I would like to add in to the council conversations. Um, and then we also, there was, um, so the amount of people, I, I, wanted, I just wanted to say that I have been in touch with uh, PMSI, and they're the people who print our bills and send everything out for us. And so the cost of actually distributing the newsletter um, would be to 2,260 people. That would be 15 cents per newsletter, and that's full color, front and back, so it's two pages. They'd pack it into the bills for us, and that would come out to $366.37 
every time we did that. Um, so that's the cost, and you know we can put that into yearly costs and everything. So but um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so super quickly, that was just on the newsletter. <laughs> um, as for council conversations, so this is something that um, I came across when I was in uh, Chapel Hill last weekend with the other LFNC fellows, and Drew Finley, who's working in Hendersonville, North Carolina, they've been doing a program called Council Conversations for the last two years. And I've seen similar things in different towns across the United States, but because I have the connection to Drew where um, uh, I looked a lot more into their um, program. Um, and pretty much what it is, is an opportunity for councilmen to meet with their constituents in their ward. So it would be the councilman from their ward, supported by town staff, and perhaps a councilman at large. Um, and it would be in the ward that they represent, in an accessible space for the community, and a much more informal, very casual setting, so that it's not the same as I'm, um, it, it's not the same as a town council meeting, essentially. It doesn't have the same formality, and um, you know, that might be intimidating for some folks who aren't used to that setting. Um, and what be, it's coupled with the newsletter right now, because um, right now, so we've had, or the idea is for the newsletter to go out on a quarterly basis, and to have, and it doesn't have to be that often, that's just the initial idea, um, and to have things that the town has accomplished or that are in progress, and then immediately how it impacts the person receiving that newsletter. And so the idea is for council conversations to happen in the month following the di distribution of the newsletter, so that, um, People who are interested in things going on in the town would already have access to some of the relevant information that's been going on, and so they'd have a basis to ask more detailed questions and um, really have a more impactful conversation than just getting base level knowledge. Um, and so that would be, the idea would be for the council conversations to happen in the month following that. Um, can I ask you a question? Yes. Does he find them well attended in Hendersonville? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So Hendersonville is a bit larger than, I mean, it's, it's quite a bit 8, 000, larger than Edenton. 8, Hendersonville about 8,000? I think it's a bit large. It's, I think it's a bit yeah. larger than that. I'm, okay. I'm not quite sure. I should have looked that up before the meeting. Um, but their attendance has been between 20 and 60 people I to each conversation, cool. which is really good attendance. And I think especially because it's in, and they usually, um, I spoke with their communications manager on, and like just on some questions that I had about their program. And they usually, they try and have it in spaces that the community is already frequenting. So for within example, that ward, within, that within that ward, yeah. So maybe a church that is in that ward or a rec center, just based like public spaces that are already in use. How are they communicated to? How do, how do they know where to go? 13,000. Um, they have, there's an announcement they put on their town website, but if, okay. and um, I'm not sure other, how else they do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, <laughs> their town manager doesn't go to them, but the idea would be for town staff to be present. So it would, yeah, yeah, it would be town <laughs> staff <laughs> and <laughs> councilmen. <laughs> and they, and they said that they do encourage their department heads to attend the meetings. So it's not a required thing, but they do encourage their department heads to do that. Um, um, so yeah, that's the basic idea of council conversations and really just the most important things about it because the structure can change depending on what y'all direct and what you think is most important. But I think that it'd be, it's very important that the setting is casual, it's an informal setting where people feel comfortable voicing their concerns, questions. Um, it's in an accessible building, so it's accessible to people of all abilities. And it's also at an accessible time, so that if you are working or have kids, and you can bring your kids if you want to, um, but that it is, it doesn't compete with working hours. And um, also that it is in the ward that people live, so that transportation becomes less of an this issue, be and they can get there. around with chairs or in a circle <clears throat> type yes. of thing, not Yes, exactly. Okay, and that is actually something that Hendersonville does on occasion. 
Um, and then because the meetings are small and informal, they have been able to do follow-up meetings. If there's an issue that has a lot of attention and a lot of people care about it, they can schedule quick follow-up meetings where they can get the community more involved in the actual process of solving an issue. Um, and then when I said about surveys, Hendersonville has done surveys at the beginning of their meeting um, to kind of create like a very loose agenda of what people think is important, what they want to discuss. Um, but I think because we're coupling it with our newsletters, we would kind of already have that loose agenda in some ways. And I think that surveys distributed after the meeting would be a really good I would be a really good way to gauge how much people care about the meetings and the newsletter and what we could do to improve. Are there any questions? Have you, have, has has, has, has Henry <coughs> had feedback um, about these meetings? Is it Positive. Yeah, it's been it's been really positive feedback. They have definitely built up a lot of trust with community members that didn't really exist before, um, in as significant as a way. There's also, um, you know, some of the meetings there has. I, I spoke to her, and she said that like one of the meeting. W was ha one of the meetings was hard like it was you know there was a lot of negative feedback about some construction going on in the area and it kind of turned into a more negative meeting but she said with the right um, control of the conversation and just just letting citizens be heard and listened to that it's still positive even if the we meeting itself is negative time within an hour, an hour like yeah. five minutes to an hour I think it's a great idea. It is a great I mean, I idea. Think it's fantastic. We at well, the at large would would be going to all of them, I guess. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could split it up between the two of you. <laughs> You're busy. Because that makes it busier. Yeah, it does. No, they don't we both. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Searsha, and also uh, Councilman Coleman for bringing Thanks, these ideas uh, to our attention. And I think it addresses uh, one of the recurring themes that Councilman Coleman and I heard on the campaign tra trail last fall. So thank you all um, for bringing those to our attention. I think it would be appropriate at this time to entertain a motion from a committee member to recommend the full council to implement the quarterly newspaper newsletter program to be included in the utility bills and to also organize and host the conversations with council um, program. So move second. We have a general consensus that, that moved to full council. And again, I appreciate everything that y'all have done. The um, next item uh, for discussion and to address is the Citizen Academy. And I feel like <laughs> Councilman Coleman and I are the new ones on the, the board. Um, uh, so I, I repeat that um, this is something near and dear to Councilman um, Coleman's heart and mine also. And the Citizen Academy, I think, was just started last year. Is that correct, Anne Marie? And it is a, a program, a class, what, seven or eight weeks where we get together one night over dinner. Uh, the town provides the um, class dinner, and then we hear from various um, departments in town about. Um, what they do for the town and what their daily life looks like, uh, what their challenges are. In fact, um, Mr. Gooden uh, presented one, uh, Bud Powell presented one, Chief King Elizabeth. and uh, Billy presented to us. And I found it very, very informative. And Roger found it very, very informative. And um, Anne Marie was there, I think, almost every time, if not every class, uh, or a lot of them. And uh, felt like it was a good idea for the citizens. And we have probably, what, 10 or 12 uh, people attend on a regular basis. I'm not sure how many graduates we had. Um, but that was our inaugural class. It went well. And there's a feeling that it would be a good thing for us to continue into the future as long as there's interest in it from our citizens. So does anybody have any questions? Amory um, or Roger, I could um, hopefully answer those. But I thought it was a very, very informative class. I, I I felt very honored to be a part of it, and the, uh, the the town went out of its way to make us feel like we were special. And there were nine of us, I think, who finished the the class, and you left with a a lot of information uh, and a lot of appreciation for the staff. Uh, if anything were to change, I would like to see maybe some way of taking all of that information and maybe challenging the, the participants to. 
to express it in some way. Like the Master Gardeners program, you put so many hours in afterwards uh, as a volunteer. It would be nice if you go through this class to uh, assign two people to work with Elizabeth. I, I don't know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but to take advantage of that enthusiasm and that knowledge and say, all right, uh, offer some ways for, for those people to, uh, to find a, a place in, in, to express that knowledge and, and uh, the information they get. It was, it was well done as well as anything I've attended, I think, in this town. And one thing that I think is important, and the class and academy helped it, there's so many misconceptions in town, and you, you hear about it on Broad Street, you hear about it in Food Line, you hear about it on social media, and people come up with the wildest things, like, I can't believe town council did this, or why did town council do that, or why didn't they do this? And there were a lot of questions asked of the participants just of them not knowing that you could see feed some misconceptions and a lot of the class members had misconceptions about how the town was managed and it was an eye-opening experience for them and I think as we talked about with the earlier action item um, I think it improves our communication and our standing with the community if we can do away with a lot of those misconceptions so it, Roger and I found it to be a great program and so I would just seek and entertain a, a motion by one of my committee members to recommend to full council that we continue with that program so for the coming year. So moved. Second. Anne Marie, did you have anything to, to add? No, we enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun for us. It was a way for the staff. We met new residents, um, people. <clears throat> we were able to engage with citizens that we might not normally have engaged. And two of our graduates ran for council and are sitting up here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> How did the presenters enjoy it? Did, did you find it interesting? Okay. Okay. The uh, next item that uh, we need to address is the uh, short-term uh, rental ordinance, and I think we're all aware that that's generated a lot of discussion, and uh, we need to decide uh, where to go uh, from here. I think Elizabeth Ryan has got some uh, relevant information to kind of recap some things for us. And staff, I think it's just seeking guidance from how we move uh, from here to the next point. And Anne-Marie and Elizabeth attended a recent workshop at the UNC School of Government, and uh, they got more ideas about how um, this issue is uh, being handled across the state. And Elizabeth's going to update us on that, and then we'll need to uh, give the council some direction uh, on where we move from here. Thank you, Councilman High, and good evening, everybody. I'll try to be brief because I know there may be a um, ball game that at least the Wolfpackers want to watch. So, <laughs> um, just want to give you kind of a brief overview <laughs> of where we are with the short-term rental ordinance. And um, for the two of you that that maybe didn't get to hear all of the background, give you some of the background information as quickly as possible, but also lead you to the point where we are now. So you, all of you know that people love to visit Edenton and we're so glad for that. Um, we're a beautiful place and we love to welcome these 25 to 30,000 visitors a year to our town with a population of about 5,000 people. Um, you're aware that we have only four traditional bed and breakfasts, three traditional hotels, motels, one extended stay, motel, and on any given day, about 23 um, short-term rentals currently. We're lucky to have the beautiful inns and beds and bed and breakfasts that we have. We are lucky to have our larger hotels for our larger events. And any given week, you can go on Airbnb or VRBO and see pictures like these. And there's at least one, every time I go home, there's at least one new uh, short-term rental that pops on the horizon. Um, they are serving a needed niche. We, we don't have enough accommodations in our town to serve us on a regular basis when we have larger events, large weddings, Christmas tour, and they provide an option for people who may not want to stay in a traditional um, accommodation setting. So we learned about these about two years ago. Um, are the traditional, not that we didn't, we weren't aware of them in general, but we learned that we had them in Edenton when our traditional accommodations industry pointed out 
uh, their existence and wanted to know how are they regulated? Are they regulated the same way that we are? And if not, why not? Um, the tax office had inquiries after they began taking over the occupancy tax billing from the county finance office wondering were we collecting occupancy tax from these short-term rentals. Um, and then general industry articles and awareness kind of brought to our attention that we needed to work with the Tourism Development Authority and the county tax office to see what were the best practices and how uh, might we fit them to Edenton. So we got input from the town council at the time. Safety was the primary concern at that point. Do they have smoke detectors? Um, are they inspected by the fire inspector? How can we be sure that the people who stay in these places are going to be safe when they're here? Uh, we also talked with the traditional accommodations industry and the Tourism Development Authority, and they wanted to be sure that we were all playing, or they were all playing on the same field, that the, the playing field was level. Uh, the tax office wanted to streamline occupancy tax collection. As you might imagine, when you've got um, an internet-based business, um, it, you may have to approach tax collection a little bit differently, reach out to those owners who may not even be aware that they should be paying occupancy tax. We also looked at other municipalities' ordinances and processes and found that, in North Carolina at least, we were the smallest town that seemed to be um, dealing with this or, or trying to put regulations in place at this time. We know that Asheville has had regulations for a while. Wilmington worked for years and just last year adopted, finally adopted regulations. We learned from the city of Raleigh that they have been working for four years, finally adopted regulations last year and feel like this year they're going to have to scrap it and start over. Um, that they, The ones that they adopted don't really address um, the issues that they're seeing. So we reached out to the School of Government and we're lucky to find Rebecca Badgett who helped us draft an Edenton size ordinance to address the problems that we were um, concerned about here and help us to have something that was feasible to implement with a small staff. So we um, hit some highlights or some big points of this ordinance that you guys may remember are a designated responsible party. So that person is someone that can be contacted um, by an occupant of these units and respond within 45 minutes and live within, I think it's maybe 30 miles in our ordinance right now. We also required that a um, STR owner or applicant notify the neighbors that their intention is to operate a um, Airbnb or short-term rental on their property. Not that they get permission, but that they notify that that's what their intention is. We also have an occupancy cap that's based on the size of the dwelling, the number of bedrooms. We wanted the owner to show the town that they have liability insurance um, to cover this use. We uh, attach a, an additional permit requirement for special events so that someone who may want to use their home not just to house people who may be attending a wedding in Edenton, but perhaps host a wedding on their property, they are actually a different category that need to apply for a special use permit through our Board of Adjustment. We also address noise and trash, trash collection by making sure that the town noise ordinance is posted within the uh, unit and on their advertisements, as well as the trash collection schedule and uh, require that the owner have the appropriate number of containers to house all the refuse that their guests will um, generate. We also talk about parking, um, requiring on-site parking, and limiting the number of uh, street parking that could be taken up by hopefully addressing the parking that would be used on-site for this um, particular dwelling. We also point out fire safety inspection requirements and require both a smoke and carbon monoxide detector in the unit. Um, the way the ordinance is set up now, an applicant would, would submit a checklist. Basically, they bring to me and certify with their signature and notary that they have met these requirements within their unit. Now, the fire inspector would still be looking to make sure that there is the smoke detector and um, that type of thing, but basically we're putting 
the onus on the owner that they have uh, adequate parking and that they've posted for trash collection and things like that. We do require that they bring in a, a statement showing that they've notified the neighbors. So that's what we have. And as y'all know, we've gone through tons of research at the staff level. We've held meetings, multiple meetings with um, the town planning board. They made some suggested revisions and presented a draft ordinance to you all back in November. I think um, you reviewed it. And if you'll recall, <laughs> rental ruckus might be the best way to describe it. Some of you may have seen this article in Business North Carolina. And um, it, there's concern on both sides, just like the traditional accommodation industry is concerned um, that the playing field be level. The owners of uh, the units, the STR units themselves, want this opportunity to have a, a business here in Edenton and feel like it's important to offer. Um, additionally, some residents are concerned about how this will impact them and their neighborhood. So that brings us to where we are today. Um, the two biggest issues that we found after that last public hearing that you all held uh, were regarding whole house rentals. That means when a whole house is available for rent without an owner present. So distinguishing that from a homestay where the owner might be present, this would be um, the entire house without the owner there. Um, and also grandfathering. So grandfathering I think staff is probably going to recommend that we leave that alone. There's a possibility that we could um, require existing short-term rental owners to comply with our ordinance uh, depending on what the legal uh, interpretation of our existing language is. But I think the more important thing to address and where we really want to seek direction from you all is about this whole house rental issue. We learned when we went to the School of Government a couple of weeks ago that every community um, that is concerned with how to handle short-term rentals in their um, jurisdiction is finding that the whole house rental is the primary concern, not the homestay or the one room in a house where someone is coming to stay. Um, and particularly w within that issue of whole house rental, the primary residence short-term rental versus dedicated short-term rental, and I'll explain that, um, is the real rub. So a primary residence short-term rental may be something like a person or a family lives in a home or uses it half to three quarters of the year. So you could consider that a primary residence. Um, the other times when they're not there, they may rent it out on a short-term basis, but they are the ones that are primarily attached or residing in that home. Um, a dedicated short-term rental, however, is one that is bought and used for the purpose of renting out on the short-term basis. Perhaps someone thinks they may retire in Edenton, but they're not there yet, and so for 10 months out of the year or more, they're going to rent this property as a, a dedicated short-term rental property. So we as a town have to decide if we are going to distinguish between the different types of whole house short-term rental and if we are going to allow dedicated short-term rentals, are we going to add additional restrictions on them? Some of those restrictions might be a cap on the number of permits. So the city of Wilmington has said, we are only going to issue X number of permits for dedicated short-term rentals. And if we issue that and you're number 501, I'm making up that number, but if, if you've, you're over the threshold, you go on the waiting list and you have to wait for a spot to open up before you can get into that exclusive group. Um, there's also the option to cap the number of rental nights permitted. So if you're that way, you're saying, well, yes, you can have a whole house rental, but you're leaning more towards that permanent resident or primary residence. So you could say only 30 nights a year 
I'm making up the number again, but that's an example where they're allowed to rent for X number of nights a year and then the rest of the time it, it's not going to be rented for a short term um, purpose. Wilmington also limits the percent per zoning district or, and require a distance separation between these dedicated short term rentals. This one would be hard for us to do in Edenton just because of our geographic size and the way our zoning districts are set up. Most of the town is town proper is either R5 or R10 residential. So we don't have a, whole, a, a, a variety of zoning districts to categorize. We only basically have two that we'd be worried about and that may be more difficult. We'd be really restricting um, use. So you can see what various lar much larger areas but those that are historic cities that um, this is straight from the School of Government themselves they did some research and found what different um, cities in in the country are doing and I pulled these particular three because they're although larger they're in character they're a lot like Edenton and you can see um, that their level of restriction is varied but they are all um, restricting that whole house short-term rental at a higher level than they are the accessory dwelling unit or the homestay. I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you but I'll please ask questions. So the question really for you all is should we allow dedicated short-term rentals? That is whole house rentals that are used for nothing but short-term rental. They're not somebody's primary residence or partial secondary residence. They are bought for the purpose of renting on a short-term basis. If we allow those, where should they be allowed? Should they be focused in our downtown core? Um, you know, as mixed use, the apartments above some of our um, businesses on Broad Street. Should they be allowed more in our commercial zones than our residential zones? After deciding where they should go, do you add other restrictions? Do you um, cap the number of permits? Do you require a separation between units, say uh, one every 500 feet? Um, or that they cannot be side by side? Uh, do you cap the number of nights rented? So. Like I said, I've thrown a lot at you, but that's where we are and your options. What we've done in the past is, uh, the, is come up with language, drafted language, and presented it to you all and you decide <coughs> if it fits, if you want to change it. Um, you could also ask the planning board to dig in more deeply on this and discuss it again, hold another public meeting and then send a recommendation back to you all. Now the planning board is meeting next Monday. They are, and now we went ahead and scheduled it with the thought that perhaps if you wanted to do that, we better go ahead and advertise it. And the reason we're trying to keep this moving because we, we think it, we will be better off if we have something adopted than not. So we're right, trying to keep the train uh, going. Is the board Planning board going to be looking at the whole house rental issue? If you direct us to do that, yes. I mean, we're talking about Monday. Yes, okay. but I guess what I'm to further explain, we scheduled and advertised a public meeting for that purpose with the thought that you might, you as the council might want us to do that. If, if you decide to have us staff draft something and bring it straight back to you, then the planning board will be informed of that on Monday and they'll handle their other business. And they'll probably be happy. Yes. <laughs> they be really they'll be very happy. <laughs> Elizabeth, at our last public meeting we held, there was a young lady in here that lived next door to someone that was running a house. Yes, sir. And if I'm, my mind, I'm, I'm kind of old, so bear with me, <laughs> but if my mind served me right, she was talking about a group of people that came into this house that party for about 24 hours, right. a lot of noise and loud music. Is there anything that we've got in these audience to protect the citizens in Edenton that lives here 
and maybe someone sells a house next to them and they rent it out like this? That is what we're asking you all to tell us how you'd like us to proceed. So while yes, we have, they always have the ability to call the police and say, can you shut down the party next door? Um, but the, that incident happened in a house where the, the use is a dedicated short-term rental or was a dedicated short-term rental. Mm -hmm. So m most of these municipalities that are seeing those same problems come up are trying to figure out, just like we are, how to best address that point. Is it saying that you're not going to allow more than a certain number of nights per year that a, a unit can be rented in that manner? Is it saying that you're not going to, going to allow dedicated short-term rentals at all? Is it saying you're only going to allow them in certain zoning districts? So what we need or would like is direction from you all on what is the most important thing to, to you. So I guess my quote, my sort of areas of concern are, number one, you know, I thought about Court Street where Hood lives. So if Hood and Bob Thomas decided to make their houses into whole house um, B&Bs, then it is impossible for them really to, there's no almost no parking on that street. Right. And they're not very close together and they're big. Right. Whereas if Vince Berger you know, or Charlie Creighton, it's just a different, it's just a different type of neighborhood. I think that we need to <clears throat> figure out some way that the proximity of neighbors to each other is taken into consideration. And I think the person that rents out, uh, if we do allow whole house Airbnbs, I think we definitely need to, to have a person in this community, not 40 minutes away, but I mean within the town limits and that is because really they need to be able to be close enough to hear if there's a problem because i mean i don't <laughs> think people ought to have to go out they buy a house it's a big investment and they have to like then every weekend have something going on and calling chief king all night long it's gonna it's gonna enrage them after a while i mean that's the i think that's the problem but it, it's you know there's some positives too but i think that's the issue is that this is just it's just ongoing every single weekend, and it just drives people to distraction, whether it's parking or what. You know, you can't park in front of your house, and you, know, you don't know who the people that own the house next door to you are. You know, that kind of thing. The one fear I have about the, um, the what you mentioned about distance from neighbors. It's so different. It, we're gonna really restrict to a very small area who would be eligible to do this if we said you have to be more than 10 feet from your neighbor's boundary line or something like that because most of Edenton is right houses are right on the property line so and we've been cautioned by the school of government about property rights and restricting people's property rights so I think that is why Wilmington for instance came up with that whatever your regulation is it, it needs to be equitable and there's a sort of a blanket approach saying this percentage and this you know we're only going to allow this many permits this percentage out of the dwelling units to be allowed to use be used for that purpose um, and then they they also have that separation requirement that they have to be so many feet from the next nearest uh, it really limits it, um, but then it's not necessarily based on the uniqueness of a person's property right. that allows them to get the permit or not. And I guess one follow-up question, what did Newburn do? Did we ever figure that out? What, what did Newburn do with theirs? My understanding is that they actually they called and asked for a copy of our draft right and then they <laughs> bell havens called me too i mean it's it's spreading for and sure I think, I think newborn passed a moratorium they did until they could figure that's out right. what they want to do um, that's the latest but we can check and see mm -hmm. but i mean that's i had heard something like that but to councilman bond's mm -hmm. question 
you know, what in our ordinance would protect residents? And had an ordin our ordinance been in place, you know, Ms. Edwards would have been notified ahead of time that her next door neighbor was operating or going to operate a whole house rental because remember she was concerned she thought that maybe that first group were the children mm -hmm. and she didn't want to call the police which I can understand that right. the other thing is we do have parking restrictions mm -hmm. we do um, we we had something about not allowing you know large trucks or RVs or something and then also um, in terms of the responsible property owner she would have known who to call to say hey you know something's going on next door that's that's not right um, so I think we we, we kind of have regulations in place to help protect or to limit impacts to neighbors what we're struggling with is you know should we have stronger limits mm -hmm in terms of actually where whole house rentals Should be located. can be Operating. in operation. And it's really <coughs> tough. I mean, it it's a, a tough, tough decision. And big cities like Raleigh that have large planning staffs, they're struggling the same way we are. Mm -hmm. um, they are. A designated, a designated responsible party right now has to live um, according to your term um, rentals in the live within 20 miles uh, within, and respond, and respond within, within 45, 45 minutes, minutes. Mm -hmm. but we're hearing that that needs I, to I be I just think somebody uh, in the middle somebody, of the night is making noise yeah, yeah. 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 they need to be close to five minutes need to be a little close absolutely okay. so that's where we are now yeah. we could say must reside within the Town of Edenton or corporate yeah. limits, you know, something on the like that. Side or within the within the town of Edenton, mm -hmm. yeah. county somewhere. Because I'd like to suggest that we make the decision rather than the planning board. Well, the I planning board wouldn't make the decision; they would just work up work a up proposed the, draft. Don't, don't you we, think we, we can do? We make the ultimate decision. Make decision. I think no, we, we, we will make it to the planning board. I think we, I think we need another public hearing. I, I think it. I think that it would be good to let the <laughs> public talk about this one more time. I limit it to five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. So, so our thoughts. We we made the ultimate decision. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. We we made the ultimate decision. But our mm -hmm. our thoughts such that okay, it's time to move it to full council and have the hearing and make the decision. Or our thoughts such that there's so much up in the air. The planning board needs to resolve some of these issues and come back to us with a recommendation. I think the issue is important enough for two sets of eyes to be on it. I know the flip <coughs> side of that, some people are saying, no, we need to have certainty. We need the council to go ahead and make a decision. But which we will. that's just my thought. Yeah, which we will. But I, I like to send it back to the planning board and let them come up with more of a draft for us to consider. That's my vote. I would yeah. say they need to come up with some recommendations and come back to us because, okay. you know, this body cannot come up with, you, you've been to the meetings, you've been to the Institute of Government, you've done a lot of things, and I think this is just one man's opinion, but I think you need to come back to us with some recommendations and the public hearing as well, and we go from there. That's just one man's opinion. They're not going to be too happy about this. So we can, we can let Elizabeth come up with the ideas. The planning, planning board, planning. I will give them some, some talking points and they will flesh out. I think she can do a better um, job than we can. Yeah, I know she can. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, think you got people involved is better. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So, but it sounds as if you all would like the planning board to consider some of these further restrictions on whole house rentals. Yes. Okay. I guess my concern is when, when this, we talked about this in the last time, we, we, uh, I think Mayor Vaughn said, you know, do you want the planning board to continue with this? And we said, no, we'll take it from there. But things have changed. You know, if you go into your meeting, you know, there's, um, <laughs> I just think that they may, they may throw that back in our face. But, you know. Is there well, I think, I think Elizabeth has new information yeah, that's, that's important that's right. for them to consider. Absolutely. Yeah, we I do. And that's what has changed. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You get that, I'm sure you'll get that across to the... Is sure, there any, absolutely. Is, is there anything that we can put to this, if, if we go in with a whole house rental, 
a house that continuously, that's blatant, that's given us trouble? Is there any language that we can put in there? We have, to, we do have that. So if there are that? violations, I think it's two, more than two um, violations, and they their permit is revoked, and they have to, and there's other examples from other municipalities that we can also look to make sure that we've got the best um, practice there. Once the violation is revoked, they don't get it anymore? Well, some, some cities have, they don't get it at all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some have a waiting period, and the waiting period um, is where the variable is. You know, some it might be they have to wait a year, some it's two. I think once one was three years, um, they're kicked off the, the, the waiting list, so to speak, and they have to wait three years okay. to apply again. But at the same time, I think there should be some language in there that said legitimate problems as well, because you may have a neighbor there that just don't want it there, and they call Chief King yeah. just to complain and say, okay, I'm going to call them twice, and then they got, they're going to lose their permit. So I, I think there needs to be some language in there that sure. it's legitimate complaints. Again, more man's opinion. Sure. True. True. Hey Marie, do we need any formal action from the committee to accomplish what I think is our consensus? I think since we kind of anticipated you might want the planning board and it's already been advertised, we can go from there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. I think the planning board is going to be busy Monday night. Yeah, good job. Yeah, good job. Thank you. Don't you wish you were still the chairman? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, we'll be at the meeting, Mayor. The next item we need to discuss is uh, item number four on the original agenda, and that's uh, an update on the minimum housing code. I don't think any action is going to be necessary after we hear from Searsha, but she's prepared to update us on her work in reviewing and researching best practices for a minimum housing code. So, Sierra Chef, you could. Yes. Hello again, Mayor and Council. Um, I do just have a brief update on where we are with work on um, updating our minimum housing codes. And um, just to give a brief refresher on this project, because we do have some new councilmen on the board. Um, this is one of my work objectives that I was assigned when I started working here as an LFNC fellow. And um, what I've found throughout researching is that really the best way, and through talking with the School of Government, Tyler Mulligan there, I'm really the best way for us to accomplish updating our minimum housing codes is to be more specific in what we define as habitable for human habitation. And to be, and that's, honestly one of the only areas that uh, municipalities have authority to change um, or to alter our minimum housing at all. Um, and so we want to make what is defined as human habitation more specific so that we have more authority to enforce um, compliance when we do run into issues with um, homes and um, yeah, so that we have more authority to enforce. So that's kind of <coughs> what the purpose of this was. And the update is after doing some research and I'm, <laughs> yeah, after research, I, I spoke to Ben Gallup, who works with Hood, uh, last Friday. And I will be following up with him this week with a list of specific recommendations that I have to make to our minimum housing code based off of best practices from other towns. Um, and a lot of it has to do with New Bern's housing, minimum housing code. And so I'm going to email him what we would like to specifically enact and why it applies to Edenton and how it fits in um, with our current code. And once we've done that, we will have another conversation on how we can best put that into legal language and um, actually move forward with updating the codes and getting public feedback. Thank you, as always, Susan. And as I said before, I don't think there's any action needed to be taken on that, Anne-Marie. No, sir. And uh, as I read our agenda, I think that concludes the committee's business. 
Thank you, Councilman High. And our next thing on our committee is on our committee reports is the Finance Committee, and that's chaired by Councilman Dixon. This will be double as long as uh, <laughs> High's committee report. <laughs> so uh, we had two things very quickly. Um, I'm going to turn both of them over to Anne Marie. If you could just describe the budget amendments and then talk about the grant agreement. Sure. So we have um, four budget amendments for you to consider this evening. Um, the first one is creating a um, small capital project in your capital project budget ordinance to accommodate the colony tire building reuse grant. You know that we received a $400,000 grant from Department of Commerce. Um, that grant requires a $20,000 cash match and the e Edenton Chowan Partnership um, the private nonprofit that the town and the county and the private sector fund has agreed to contribute the match, um, which is $20,000. So Virginia has created the budget ordinance um, to reflect the revenues coming in, those two revenue items, and then the expenditures that we will make um, once Colony has satisfied the requirements of the grant. Do you want me to do them all? Yeah, do them okay. all. Go ahead and do them all. So the second budget amendment is another um, small projects capital budget ordinance. And this will be um, for the general fund small projects ordinance. And this will um, create revenue to be received from the North Carolina Department of Public Safety. And that is a grant that Chief King and his staff wrote um, to fund the purchase of upgraded um, body cameras for the police officers, as well as for the proper um, storage, you, iCloud storage, uh, not on a hard server, but it is it meets the requirements of the statutes and the laws. <coughs> so this budget amendment shows the revenue coming in from Department of Public Safety and then the expenditure um, made by the police department. And I did want to mention that originally we were going to request purchase of some laptops through that grant, but the um, requirements for the storage, the electronic storage, um, caused us to drop off the request for laptops. And Chief and Rosa have assured me that the grant will be um, reflected that we won't be required to purchase the laptops, so they're okay with that. The funding agency is okay with that. The third um, budget amendment is for the electric fund small capital project, and that is to reflect the purchase um, of the bucket truck that you approved at your last meeting. Um, we show the debt proceeds from the loan from the bank and then the expenditure out. And then finally, the last amendment has um, is a, an amendment to the general fund itself. It's not a small capital project because it's only a $4,700 expenditure. And this is something that we really hope you'll approve because the back door at Town Hall is giving us a fit. We used to be able to, um, it's over 30 years old, and we used to be able to get out in the evening with one hip check because the door <laughs> would just <laughs> stick, but now it's taking two. And uh, it's really difficult to open. The frame, it's a metal frame, and the frame has worn out and shifted, and all of my colleagues that work at Town Hall can attest that this is a much needed expenditure. Um, fortunately, we are receiving um, sales tax proceeds, sales tax revenues coming in higher than what we projected. So Virginia um, recommends that we increase that revenue line item sales tax by 4700 and then do an amendment to the town hall um, building maintenance and repair line item by $4,700. I think a lot of good news in there, though. Yes, yeah, so yes. Yeah. And it's the two of y'all. Everybody okay send those to full council? 
All right, and the last <laughs> item is um, that the grant agreement that we mentioned in the previous discussion on the budget amendment, the North Carolina um, Crime Commission grant agreement, that paperwork um, is ready to be signed if the council will approve um, execution. There's no match required for that. It's, um, it's a great program, That's and great. Chief yeah. and his staff are really skilled at writing the grant agreement and um, if you rec want to recommend we'll put that on the okay. agenda for council to approve in February. Thank you Chief for that great grant writing. Um, I, as far as I can concern, we'll send it up. You got to have me. Sure. That's it for the finance committee. My son. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, completed our committee reports, and at this time, I would ask for a motion to adjourn the committee meetings and reconvene the special meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carried. All right, so we will. And we, it's um, not expected that the council will take any action after the special meeting. So. No, take action. No, no. Just a we No, we're not finished. We want to close. back in. You need that motion to go back into open session. Okay. Okay, uh, we have con concluded our closed session. Uh, so, is there a motion to return to our open session? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed, like sign. Okay, we're back in open session. And at this time, I would uh, ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Have a motion in a second. We're jerks. Thank you, Mr. Bosley. Amen. Amen.